consider? Because of the history of violence against abortion providers and abortion clinics in this country, like Ms. Selinger's own attempted bombing for which she went to prison, Congress gave the federal government extraordinary powers to try to stop this violence and to stop threats of violence against abortion providers and to stop the extreme anti-abortion movement from blocking access to clinics. Those powers come from a law that's called the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act, the FACE Act. It was passed in 1993 and it says that Things that might be considered minor crimes at other facilities are federal crimes when they happen at abortion clinics. Because of the pattern of terrorizing tactics and violence against abortion providers and because of the national interest in stopping this form of terrorism. For example, the federal crimes defined by the FACE Act include, quote, intentionally damaging or destroying the property of a facility or attempting to do so because such facility provides reproductive health services damaging or destroying the property of an abortion facility, in other words, is a federal crime. If it's a first offense, it's punishable by up to six months in prison. Second offense, 18 months in prison. Federal authorities are obligated, of course, to enforce that law. And under President Clinton, federal authorities were enthusiastic about enforcing it. According to the Justice Department and investigative work by reporter Daphne Evyatar at the Washington Independent today, the Clinton administration prosecuted 17 defendants for violations of the FACE Act in 1997 alone, and an average of about 10 per year since the law was enacted in 1994. On the other hand, prosecutions of FACE Act violations nearly disappeared under President Bush. The Bush administration brought only, brought, out, brought only about two criminal prosecutions per year in the entire country under the FACE Act and never more than four in any single year. What happens when you stop enforcing a law like this, a law that's designed not only to go after individually politically motivated criminals, but to shut down the networks among them? Well, that brings us back to what happened in Kansas this weekend. What happened with Scott Roeder and what we're now learning about the history of violence against abortion clinics. His history of intentionally damaging or destroying the property of abortion clinics, which is of course, under the FACE Act, a federal crime. We're now learning that over the past nine years, Mr. Roeder targeted one Kansas clinic in particular. It's the Central Family Medicine Clinic in Kansas City. Mr. Roeder glued the doors of that clinic shut at least four times over the past nine years. Mr. Roeder, of course, allegedly entered a Wichita church and murdered Dr. George Tiller this past Sunday. Just one day before that, Mr. Roeder was at that clinic in Kansas City, gluing shut the doors of the Central Family Medicine Clinic again. It's a clear violation of the FACE Act. It's a federal crime. And it's an offense that we're now learning the FBI was notified about, not just this past Saturday when it happened, but time and time and time again over the past nine years. As far as we know, for any of these matters, Mr. Roeder was never arrested. Joining us now is Jeffrey Peterson, the office manager for the Central Family Medicine Clinic in Kansas City. He is appearing in silhouette tonight in order to protect his safety. And to help with that, we've also chosen not to use his real name. Mr. Peterson, thank you very much for agreeing to come on the show tonight. Hi, Rachel. Thank you. I know that Mr. Roeder has been a frequent presence at your clinic over the past decade. Um, going back to the year 2000, can you describe what he was doing when he showed up at the clinic a few times that year? Just, um, well, he was a, a picketer at that time from time to time, but he super glued our front and back doors I know uh, that two, weekends, two weekends in a row. When that happened, um, I know that you reached out to the FBI uh, at that time. Um, what specific information about the gluing the door shut did you provide to the FBI? Um, at that time, we had analog uh, videotape. We handed that over to uh, FBI. Uh, they made still photos. The pictures weren't the best in the world, but I knew who it was because he had been a regular of our clinic and I normally keep track of license plates of all my protesters, so I told FBI I know who it is, here's his license plate. Um, FBI told me that it was pictures were probably not good enough to prosecute with, but they'd have a talk with them. And uh, interestingly, he disappeared for six years. I didn't see him. So the talk worked rather well. Um, and, and so he didn't show up again, for, he didn't come back to the clinic again for another six years. That was between 2000 
and 2006, but then he did return in 2006. And what sort of a presence was he outside the clinic at that time? And did you recognize him from six years before? Oh, yes, I recognized him. And he was probably visiting us maybe every other month or every third month. And he'd visit with my local protesters. Did you remain in contact with the FBI about Mr. Roeder at that point? Um, actually, no, I hadn't contacted him about his infrequent visits. He wasn't bothering us. But then let's flash forward to uh, about two and a half weeks ago, May, May 23rd. It's a Saturday, and Mr. Roeder shows up at your clinic again. What happened on that Saturday? Well, we were closed that Saturday, so nothing happened. It was the following Monday, Memorial Day. Um, staff was there mowing the lawn. They tried to let themselves into the building, and it was locked. They called me at about 8 or 8.30 in the morning on Monday, and I said, I'm sorry, I'll take care of it later. And I came to the clinic about 1 or 2 o'clock and took care of cutting locks and drilling them out and doing what I had to to get the clinic open, got the locks replaced, um, made a over-the-phone report with the local police department, and called FBI. And I... You know, I, I didn't have anything further to give at that time because I had not had time to review the tapes. I spent probably five hours re reviewing security tape, still with no faith. So you weren't able to identify him from looking at the tapes for May 23rd? On that Monday, I was not able to, no. Okay. Um, I know that Mr. Roeder showed up again this past Saturday, which was just a day before Dr. Tiller was killed. What were the circumstances of him showing up again, and what was your response? Um, I'm going to back up just a little bit. I did on Thursday the 28th locate his face on the security tape. Okay. Um, and I did contact uh, FBI. I handed over the video to them on that date. Um, upgraded security on Friday and 11 hours later he came to the clinic like 10 minutes till 6 in the morning so I'm, I'm sorry to, to introduce Jeff just to just to be clear Mr. Peterson so he had been there on Memorial Day weekend when you initially looked at the tapes you weren't able to identify him but later in the week you were and then you upgraded your security videotapes so you'd be able to get clearer images in the future is that right Correct. Okay. And then it was just, it was after you had done that upgrading of your security system that he then came back the following weekend. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm sorry. Carry on. So this past, this is this, this past Saturday, he ended up coming back. And, and what did you see and what happened? Um, yeah, it was the 30th, Saturday the 30th at 5.50 in the morning. He uh, had parked uh, near the clinic. A staff member was returning from a convenience store. Um, saw the car but couldn't tell who was there since the driver's side window appeared to be tinted. Um, she went on inside the building, locked the front door, um, and as she was moving about inside, she saw that a man came out of the vehicle and was heading towards the back door. So she uh, started towards the back door also, and by the time she got to the back door, she was able to see through the plexiglass that he was uh, gluing the door. And so she ran towards the door, and he saw her coming. He bolted, and she chased after him. Um, she'd had a rather like three-minute conversation with him, like, um, why are you doing this, and I know who you are. And she eventually got his license plate, and once she had that, she came back into the building, and he uh, took off. He kept calling her baby killer. So at that point, when, with that last incident, which again was this Saturday, which is the day before Dr. Tiller was killed, you had a witness, your employee, who recognized him. You had the license plate number from his vehicle, and you had him on your improved security videotape. Did you provide all that information to the FBI after that incident on Saturday? Yes. As soon as I got off the phone with her, at six, or she called me at about 6.05. I probably contacted FBI like right after that, within five minutes. I got voicemail. I left the information. I said, um, he hit us again. It's the same guy. Um, and his license plate is 225BAB. Um, about two hours later, 8, 8.30, something like that, um, I actually spoke uh, with the FBI um, and was informed that the, we couldn't do anything probably, that we were going to have to get a grand jury. And from that, we'd be able to get a warrant to pick him up. 
Jeffrey Peterson, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. I know this is not an easy decision uh, to do this. Good luck to you, and thanks for joining us. Mm, thank you. I should note that we called the FBI in Kansas again today, and they confirmed to us that they were in fact notified of Mr. Roeder's acts of vandalism at the Kansas City Clinic this past weekend. They say they opened up an investigation into the incident. Again, the last lock gluing incident reported to the FBI happened the day before Dr. Tiller was killed. The FBI would not comment any further on it because that investigation, they say, is still ongoing. They also acknowledged to us that this specific allegation, gluing shut the doors of an abortion clinic, is in fact a federal crime. It's a, it's a violation of the FACE Act, which of course leaves us with a major question. When the FBI was informed of Mr. Roeder's damaging property at an abortion clinic back in 2000, when they were provided evidence of this violation, why didn't they prosecute the crime then? They had him on tape committing the crime, they had his license plate number, they had witnesses who recognized him or reported the crime. They knew he had been arrested in 1996 for having explosives in his vehicle. And despite that knowledge, despite having the power to arrest him, and supposedly federal encouragement and assistance to do so, Mr. Roeder was permitted to walk free. He was thereby allowed to commit that same federal crime over and over again, recognized and reported to the FBI each time, until the day that he allegedly murdered Dr. George Tiller. The whole reason we have special laws in this country to prevent anti-abortion terrorism, which is, has killed a lot of people and terrorized a whole lot more, the reason we have these laws and why it's frankly handy when they're actually enforced is so when anti-abortion extremists commit crimes designed to terrorize abortion providers and those crimes are reported to authorities, those individuals can be arrested and prosecuted before someone dies. Again, 